Hello and welcome to today's Bible study from College Lutheran Church and from me, Pastor David Drebus. It's good for us to study God's Word and we continue to do that using this list of the top 100 essential Bible passages. And this is a list that was put together by the Reverend Dr. Dave Delaney. He's the assistant to the Bishop of the Virginia Synod of the ELCA. And we thank Dave for this resource. You can find it linked in the materials related to this video. Well, we come today to lesson number 30, the sacrifice of confession, Psalm 51. And uh, we'll start by, of course, I've got my study Bible in front of me here, but I like reading the Psalms out of the King James Version. There's just some extra poetry to the King James Version. And if you look in your Bible at Psalm 51, it starts with a note that this is a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. If you remember from a previous Bible study in this series, we had read 2 Samuel chapter 12, which tells the story of King David's adultery with Bathsheba and then his murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, as an attempt to cover up his sin. The prophet Nathan calls David out and says, you are the one who did this wicked thing, and David is contrite at the end of the story. So it's interesting now to read a psalm that is uh, told from King David's perspective on all this. It begins with these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You can hear David's anguish at this. And um, he goes on in verse 4 to say something that may be troubling if we don't read it carefully. He says to God, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. David is saying that it's against God that he has sinned. And there's no mention in this psalm of Uriah or Bathsheba, uh, which could trouble us. It seems like, you know, they deserve some mention as the victims of his misdeeds. And perhaps they do. Perhaps that's a fair critique. But I think there's a deeper meaning to all this. And um, it's not a minimization of the wickedness that's been done to those two. But in fact, if we truly believe in God and we believe that we are all uh, children of God, then the sins that we commit against one another are not just sins against one another, but they are sins against God. And to believe in God is to believe that we are doing harm to God when we harm one another. That's what's meant by verse 4. It's not a minimization of um, the sin against Bathsheba and the sin against Uriah. It's actually a maximization. It's uh, maximizing um, the, um, the sin and saying these things are so bad because they aren't just sins against my brother or sister. They're, my, they're sins against God as well. Uh, verse 7 goes on to say something that puzzled me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I've never been sure exactly what hyssop is. So I looked through a bunch of these books behind me, and I did not find a good answer. So then I did the next best thing. I googled, and I didn't find the answer. So then I did the third best thing, what I probably should have done from the beginning. I emailed the Reverend Dr. Dave Delaney, and I asked him, what is hyssop? And he replied um, that it might be this plant that the Greeks called Osopos, which was used from ancient times in herbal medicine, but it's probably a different plant, what we now call marjoram. And uh, it probably isn't a, um, a literal cleansing that's going on here. This isn't sort of a reference to how people washed their clothes or washed their bodies. Um, but uh, Dave goes on to say it, something else involving a symbolic kind of sprinkling with water. Uh, more ritual than actual cleansing. There's parallels in Babylonian literature about the purifying attributes of shrubs like marjoram or hyssop. And so what we're probably thinking about here is um, a branch of hyssop uh, using it like a whisk, or um, if your congregation uh, in baptism has ever um, done asperges with uh, a pine branch, you know, where you 
put the pine branch in the baptismal water and you sort of fling it over everybody. Might be something uh, more like that. Um, imagine taking a bunch of the hyssop plants and um, sprinkling one's forehead with water or sprinkling the forehead of another with water. More of a ritual action. So we appreciate Dave Delaney for offering us uh, some of his expertise. Um, verses 10 and 11 are what I'm drawn to next. And uh, this is puzzling, troubling, and comforting all at once. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Uh, in Lutheran churches, this is part of the offertory in the liturgy uh, that we sing on Sunday mornings. Now, we don't sing these words every week when we gather to worship, but it's part of our um, ongoing liturgical pattern. So you may be familiar with those words. Did you ever think that those were written by someone who had committed adultery and committed murder to cover up the adultery? And those words are now part of our liturgy. Now that could be disturbing to think about, but it also makes me wonder about people who stay away from church because they think they're not welcome there because of something going on in their lives. Or people who have come to church and they feel like they're surrounded by all these holy people who are better than them, and somehow they don't belong in that pew. I wonder how they would feel if they knew uh, that we were singing words that were coming from someone who had committed grave sins, confessed their sins to God, and, um, and they are part of the story of who we are as the people of God. Uh, King David is someone that we don't shy away from his sins, and yet he is somebody that we still look up to as a servant of God. And that's just a reminder, people of God are not perfect people of God. There's one perfect person, Jesus Christ. Well, uh, verses uh, 17 um, goes on to, verses 16 and 17 go on to say something else uh, that deserves mention before we bring this study to a close. Um, verse 16 reads, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it, Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That's just a reminder that um, sort of begins uh, not with outward deeds, but um, what it means to, to come to God with a spirit of confession and a contrite heart. Um, God is in the uh, practice of offering forgiveness to those who come to him seeking forgiveness. And so that should be of great comfort uh, to you and to me. And we're called to do things um, later, but um, most of all, we're called to just return to the Lord our God, um, confident that he forgives sins, confident that we still belong to his flock, confident that just like David, uh, King David, there are no things in the world that can stop us from, from still belonging to the people of God. I hope that's of comfort to you. It's certainly of comfort to me. I hope that the next time you're in a church that sings these words, you'll remember where they came from. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen.